Hello to everyone and welcome to this Zoom Europe Day panel discussion on uh, which is aiming to celebrate Europe Day. As uh, my Jean Monnet Chair program was planning to uh, hold an event on that particular day, of course we were planning to have a real event in the university premises in the campus, but given the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, all universities' activities have been moved into Zoom and so had this event. So we're having one of the first maybe Europe Day events on Zoom, <laughs> as this week will be sort of marking this important uh, anniversary through the use of like uh, electronic and sort of like software and electronic means. Uh, let me begin by introducing for, for our students uh, the importance of Europe Day. Europe Day stands to represent the advent of a new era in Europe. It, it stands to represent the end of war and conflict between European nations and European people. Don't forget that the 8th of May is the end of the Second World War. 9th of May is Europe Day. So it, it signals a transition from Europe of conflict, nationalism and war to Europe of cooperation and sort of integration. And of course, on that particular day, on the 9th of May, 1950, uh, Robert Schumann made his famous Schumann Declaration, which was a blueprint for uh, the integration of this very, very sort of traumatized continent. Uh, and uh, Schumann like, led a plan that more or less has been followed throughout the history of the European economic community and the, economic in, in the European Union. So uh, we are here today to discuss this with two very distinguished speakers, two real experts who can bring us the very valuable insights into what Europe Day means in light of the two other important issues that I'm sure matter very much for our students, which is uh, the pandemic crisis as a global and a European event. What does it bring into the European integration discussion? What does it bring into bilateral relations? What does it bring into eu turkey relations? And of course, uh, the topic of eu turkey relations. So like, it's a very long story, like, I'm not, I don't know how our speakers would like to refer into this. They know like uh, more than anybody on this uh, issue. So how is this going to be factored into uh, the situation we live today? So we have uh, two distinguished uh, speakers, as I said, and the idea is to give them the floor for about 20 minutes and then Maybe I respond for a couple of minutes and then we open the discussion for all students to ask their questions and participate. So uh, we have with us Mr. Nicolò Rinaldi, who is a former member of the European Parliament. So, and he's currently working in the European Parliament, right? So he is the head of unit for Asia, Australia, and New Zealand in the Directorate General for External Policies of the European Union. So he has a very unique perspective into what we were discussing today, because he has been both working within the bureaucracy of the European Union, and he has been a sort of a representative of the European people as well. So that's a very interesting uh, combination. And also we have Ms. Nil Yun Arisan Eral, who uh, is currently the director of the EU Study Centers at TEPAV. TEPAV is, uh, is one of Turkey's leading think tanks. So she has been uh, leading uh, policy research on the European Union-Turkey relations at TEPAV. But before her uh, taking her position at TEPAV, she used to be a national program director at the Secretariat General for the European Union Affairs of the Republic of Turkey. So again, she has a very interesting double uh, sort of insight into a very important topic. So. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today uh, on this very important uh, day for Europe. And uh, I would suggest we start with uh, Mr. Rinaldi and then uh, Mr. Uh, Arisan Rao. 
So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, to, first of all, to, to thank uh, uh, Professor Yannis Gregori uh, for uh, the very uh, appreciated invitations uh, to join you in uh, this uh, special, uh, special day, special uh, occasions in your wonderful uh, Wilkent University. And I would like also to, to say hello to Mrs. Ralph. I know Tepaf was doing a tremendous job. Also, the Bilkent University, actually, on an academic ground, and, and tap up on, on your own uh, um, uh, sectoral work to, to promote the European project in a, in a very difficult uh, time, uh, in, indeed. Um, Ioannis, you mentioned three, three issues. <laughs> the, the day of celebrating Europe, this 9th of May, uh, where Europe wanted to change the course of its own history. Uh, what's happening now um, with the COVID, which is a certainly a very interesting case on how uh, some kind of proto-federal supranational organization such as the EU can respond. And then uh, a topic which is certainly in, uh, in, in my heart, I think in our heart, which is the relationship between Turkey and, uh, and the European Union. Uh, uh, years ago, I've been one of the co-author of this book, Welcome Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in Italian, but it has been translated also in English. Benvenuta Turchia, Welcome Turkey. Uh, I contributed to, to, to that. Um, uh, let me say, first of all, something about myself. You, you say that my, my profile, etc. I've been a member of the European Parliament between 2009 and 2014. Uh, and uh, during those five years, I've been also the vice president um, of the European uh, Liberal Democrats. I've been also a candidate uh, for the European elections in uh, 2014 and again last year in 2019. But my party back to Italy in both occasions didn't get enough votes to elect anybody. So we, we stayed below the required threshold. Uh, it's, uh, um, uh, progressive, liberal, uh, secular, and uh, pro-European party. To me, it sounds ideal, but certainly this is not very popular in, uh, in the current uh, political and social mood in, uh, back in, uh, in my uh, country. Um, having said that, we're still very active and uh, we still promote our, our ideas and our values. Uh, nevertheless, in um, uh, early 90s, in 1991, so known of your students uh, was born at that time, I became uh, um, an official of the European institutions before I'd been uh, uh, for a couple of years in the United Nations. Uh, and uh, since then, I have been uh, involved in different capacities in external relationships of the, of the European uh, Parliament, uh, shortly the European Commission, shortly the European uh, external action services um, and currently as you said I'm in, in charge of a regional department very big because we cover all countries going from Iran to uh, New Zealand not the Middle East uh, but we are in charge of the relationship between the European Parliament and uh, I mean Asia and uh, Oceania uh, that includes, of course, major powers such as India, Japan, uh, China, of course, uh, and extremely politically interesting countries such as Afghanistan or Iran and, uh, and so on. So I have, so to say, um, a point of observation, which I, I think it's, uh, it's certainly interesting. But uh, let's come back when I, uh, talking about the 9th of May, when I, I joined the European uh, um, Union, at that time it was the European Community in 1991, I, um, when I was a student, I was engaged in um, promoting uh, European federalism. Uh, it was some kind of political activities that was relatively popular at that time among the students. And um, 1991 was a time where the Cold War was basically going to end. Uh, the Berlin Wall at fall. And so the, the, we, we thought that we had a wonderful space of uh, uh, inspiration and opportunity to change the world, basically, and to build something uh, relatively quickly in order to get uh, Europe uh, altogether. 
And uh, the society uh, was very much on board with that kind of project. And so a lot of things were done relatively quickly. The Maastricht Treaty and East Treaty, all things that you, 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 your students uh, certainly uh, went uh, through. Uh, Schengen, the Euro, uh, the European Constitutions, uh, the European Convention first, uh, uh, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, and a number of other things like that. Certainly there were always constraints. Nothing was easy. Uh, the European Constitutions, as we know, failed. Uh, but most of it was actually taken back into the Lisbon into the Lisbon Treaty. But there was certainly a very positive mood, including two factors that are important for us now: uh, the big enlargement, which basically doubled the number of countries, and that was really perceived as the way after the communist era in uh, half of Europe to reunite Europe and the membership of Turkey which at the beginning of the 90s was really, you remember the custom union, which was basically done relatively quickly, um, uh, was uh, something that was of great uh, inspiration. As much as the big enlargement uh, with the West, with the Balkans, uh, peace of Soviet units, etc., represented the way to uh, uh, overcome um, half century of divisions in Europe, uh, the perspective of having, having Turkey in the European Union was the way to reunite the Mediterranean, to reunite uh, the West and the East, to reunite um, mostly Christian countries with the mostly Muslim countries uh, in, in one single dimension based on what? Based on the concept of citizens and of the concept of secular uh, institutions. So it was a very ambitious project and to some extent, it is interesting now to, 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 to think at that time because among a lot of people, the membership of Turkey was perceived as something much easier to achieve than the membership of a number of Eastern, Central and European uh, and Central and Eastern uh, European uh, countries. Because, um, well, Turkey was not coming from a communist uh, era. So it was already there. It was already with a market economy. It was already very much in the business uh, with a lot of exchange, uh, et cetera. Uh, Turkey, secondly, was already um, fully integrated in the Western community also through NATO and through the Council of Europe. And uh, finally, uh, Turkey was a Mediterranean country. And uh, we all know that uh, there is a Mediterranean dimension, which is anyway behind the institutions there. And it is, it is something that culturally, socially, historically, it has been very well uh, established. So there was certainly much more um, contacts, already established since uh, centuries, contacts with Turkey than with a number of countries that for uh, quite a number of decades were in the Soviet Union, like the Baltic countries, uh, and uh, with very different political political systems. And the Mediterranean dimension was something which was, to some extent, shared not only by the Mediterranean um, European Community countries, but also by the United Kingdom, because which has always been very supportive. The United Kingdom somehow is a Mediterranean, or was a Mediterranean country, Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, and then also the the, the, the powers the, the British had on Egypt and Palestine and, uh, and so on. I witnessed all this kind of process. Now looks something really very far in, 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 in time and uh, uh, um, we are not anymore in, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, in that context to the extent that as much as I was convinced, like most of my colleagues in the early 90s, that we would have witnessed uh, Turkey in the European Union and would have witnessed also the creation of the United States of Europe, uh, probably now that I'm in, uh, in my late 50s, um, I, I will probably stop working in Brussels and I, pretty sure I will not see the United States of Europe and will not see uh, Turkey as member of, of, of European. So what we do have to celebrate after all, <laughs> given the, the degree of expectations we had, which was somehow well-grounded, uh, there has been a number of failures and 
we could say that there is very little to, 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 to celebrate to talking about Europe's day. But of course, that depends on the kind of time perspective that we, 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 we take. Uh, uh, now, I guess uh, most of you students, uh, or some of you certainly is, 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 uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, aware of the, of the poem by uh, Anglo Anglo American poet Eliot, no, the, from from the quartets, uh, 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 which is, is the uh, uh, time present and time uh, uh, past are both present in uh, in uh, in time uh, future and time future uh, is contained in time past. So uh, the the time dimension is very much an issue uh, when we have to celebrate something and when we have to think where we are, where we go, where what, what we did achieve. Uh, in a way, it is a, a very easy exercise to compare what we have now in Europe, um, and that includes not only the European Union, also Turkey, and what we had before. Uh, any, any, every month when we, we, we go from Brussels to Strasbourg, where we have the other um, uh, quarters of the European Parliament, we, we go not very far from the battlefields of Verdun. Well, Verdun was, was a place that were, in a, in a bit more than one year, 750,000 European people died. I don't know if there were Turkish uh, troops in Verdun, but certainly there were not just Germans and French, there were British, there were Polish, there were Belgians, there were Italians, and they, they died in the most awful way in the trenches of the First World uh, War, uh, which was a war that my grandfather did. So we're not talking about the Middle Ages. Uh, it's, it's, after all, it's, it's yesterday. Huh? Then we did have the 30s with the emergency, the, the, the coming up of dictatorship, strong nationalism, etc. It was interesting to read some statements by Ataturk in, in the 30s. Um, how progressive they were compared to Italian fascist and, and other dictatorship uh, around. How much more when, when we talk about the kind of friendship he wanted to establish with the, with the people of America, he had established with the people of America, the kind of friendship he had established with the people of Europe. Uh, there, there was really uh, um, um, a very interesting perspective. While in, in, in some other European countries, uh, we were just preparing for uh, atrocities, and then atrocities uh, uh, came up uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the war. With, uh, I mean, sometimes we, as young people, they really do not think uh, that much what was, for instance, the Dresden bombing. Uh, Dresden in uh, February 45 was not a military target. It was just a city, plenty of refugees uh, coming from the Eastern Front and trying to, to escape to the uh, um, uh, advance of the, of the Red Army. Uh, the, the British wanted to punish the German people. The Americans said, we are not interesting. It's, it's useless to bomb uh, Dresden because uh, Military speaking, there is, no, there is no point. The British want it, and in two nights with conventional bombs, they, they killed more people than in Nagasaki or in Hiroshima. Uh, it's just enough to think of what is the Shoah means, uh, and, 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 and we see the kind of degree of, of, uh, of um, um, uh, deterior moral deterioration uh, that Europe had, had reached. Um, and even after the war, it was not necessarily very easy. Um, in the 40s, uh, after the war, Italy and Belgium signed, for instance, an agreement to uh, facilitate the migration of, of, of um, Italian workers to Belgium, basically to work in the, in the coal mines of, of Belgium. Uh, Italy was an extremely poor country, uh, huge unemployment. Belgium was a completely destroyed country, needed labor forces, but the Italians were not very much welcome. There were plenty of shops in, in Belgium that had the signs outside, uh, interdit aux chiens et aux italiens, so uh, no entry for dogs and for Italians. Uh, decades afterwards, an Italian uh, um, origin Belgium, Elio de Rupo, became prime minister, and uh, Belgium, two few years ago, had an Italian queen, Paola Rufo di Calabria. So, how hugely 
uh, has been the transformation of this uh, such a controversial, problematic uh, European, uh, European land. And very easily, of course, we can uh, make examples, comparison, Turkey today, Turkey uh, some decades uh, uh, ago. Is that enough? Because after all, notably the young generation um, takes this stability, peace, um, common civilization and so on, something for granted. It's not enough anymore. Uh, that's the past, very important. You achieved, fine, but then what's next? And what's next is, is, very, is still very problematic. And the narrative on how important it has been to, 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 to end the 2,000, 3,000 years of European civil war, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is something that has to be stressed, in my opinion, and that's why I'm talking about it, but certainly is not, is not enough when we, we, we try to celebrate something that has to contain the past dimension, but also has to, to give a, a future, uh, future uh, perspective. Nevertheless, what we can celebrate is that the European project is still there with institutions, with a platform, procedures, uh, forms of, of cooperation that to some extent uh, have not anymore the kind of uh, progressive inspiration that they had uh, in, in, in the past, but they're still there. And uh, to the people, uh, notably the young people of Europe, uh, European Union and, uh, and Turkey uh, as well, of course, uh, who criticize the, the failure of European project uh, nowadays, I always say that there is a huge difference between uh, having some kind of institution, maybe weak, maybe not really inspiring, not motivating, but they are there, and having nothing. There is a huge difference, and we have to appreciate, and we have to work with what we do uh, have. Uh, now. Certainly we are in a very slow uh, process and certainly Europe or the European project is not perceived anymore as a sort of winning project, uh, the project of the future, but is still, is, still, uh, is still there. We certainly have been very much affected and, uh, and this is an issue also when we talk about the COVID by the 2008, 2009 and following years financial crisis. The Euro was established. Um, we always thought uh, that the Euro, the creation of a common currency was the way to pave the road for having political institution very, very quickly. Didn't work like that. The crisis arrived in a way that uh, discrepancy and uh, and uh, feeling for injustice, uh, fiscal dumping and things like that was very much felt by 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 the public opinion, by the society, and uh, the whole process, uh, in a, in a way, uh, slowed down, and somehow it did, uh, it did, uh, it did stop. Uh, in the meanwhile, of things, of course, things have been changing uh, in the in the rest of the world, and Europe maybe did not really realize that it's been changing in China, it's been changing very much in the United States of America since the the, the last elections and the new in the new administration. So a number of things that more or less we thought were a bit settled, that they, they were not. And changed a lot also in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, which went through a very important political and somehow also transfer, uh, economic uh, uh, transformation. I can see that Turkey is certainly very much frustrated by the lack of uh, European commitment to um, engaging with Turkey on a solid basis. And uh, on, on that, I never believe that uh, half solution are a solution. I never believe that special uh, partnership, uh, uh, privileged neighbor status, uh, they can really work. Um, or something like everything but membership. No, uh, in a transitional way they can work. But I, I, uh, my, my, my opinion is that either we have membership, full membership, and you are there, you are in the system, uh, or there is very little point to, 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 to work uh, on, uh, on, on that kind of common, of com common goal. Um, then once you are there, there is a huge uh, 
uh, room for flexibility for I mean uh, uh, different speeds as we we have a euro area Schengen area not everybody is applying a social uh, policy and and so on but but certainly uh, the goal of membership now uh, as also it is perceived in European Union, it is something very remote. And at the same time, I think Turkey is, is feeling, like many European citizens, that the European project, as I, I said, is not a winning, is not attractive uh, anymore. Uh, this, this, this doesn't work. Those people in Brussels, they, 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 it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, they, they, there is not really. Um, and uh, uh, I would say that, um, um, Turkey should not, take this in a personal way, so to say. Uh, Europe is not able today to give proper answer, not only to Turkey, but even to very small countries uh, where there is not a demographic issue. A country such as Kosovo, such as uh, Bosnia, such as Albania. Are they Muslim? It's not, an, it's not that the issue. We are not able to provide answer to Serbia and they are there lining and say we want to enter in the European Union. It's simply not the moment, unfortunately, now to have further enlargement because there is, the Europe there is, is focused, when I say Europe, I mean the EU, of course, is focused on uh, its own internal, internal issue. It's not simply a matter of Turkey, unfortunately, I would say. It is something which is much, much wider. Uh, and uh, and uh, Europe certainly is, uh, is not that winning project anymore to the extent that we even manage the, 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 the masterworks uh, to, to achieve the loss of the United Kingdom that we left, which was something unthinkable until a few years ago. So what we have to celebrate into, in, the, in, in the first the Europe's days uh, after the, the Brexit, very little after, after, uh, uh, after all. Nevertheless, we are still there we are living on the same land and COVID now becomes an interesting, an interesting case because uh, COVID poses exactly, more or less, exactly the same problems everywhere. It is a very uh, similar challenge uh, in America, in, uh, in Europe, in Asia, how we organize the economy, uh, how, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, same problems and huge impact uh, not only uh, on uh, on every single uh, European uh, or Mediterranean countries, but on also uh, the very identity of the European Union, which is mobility, which is a common market, uh, which is a circulation of people, of goods, uh, which is competition and fair competition. And when you close the borders, when you, you, you try to, 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 to stop a number of goods uh, uh, going across, your frontiers, you, you, when you open or you close some industrial uh, sectors, uh, you, you enter also in a, in a very crucial area, which is uh, uh, the competition uh, issue and fair competition in the, in the European Union. Uh, how did we respond as European? How we are responding? It's, it's a very complicated issue. And, um, and, uh, and again, it's a very mixed uh, picture. Let's say like that. First of all, um, um, we do have, it, that's interesting, um, um, the so-called, I mean, it's, so called, it's called like that officially, the European Mechanism for Civil Protection, which is established, has been established in the Lisbon Treaty. It has been used uh, something like 300 times uh, everywhere in different places in the world. I witnessed myself, for instance, the magnificent work that the, the European civil protection state in uh, Haiti and uh, the European citizens can be very proud of uh, this uh, uh, mechanism uh, for what has been uh, uh, operational European solidarity uh, across the world. Actually it was not really applied to the COVID. So the European citizens can be proud of what we did outside, but the European citizens didn't see very little in terms of delivering for, for, for themselves. Uh, it has been activated, this mechanism as a procedure, so it has been activated in few occasions uh, in, uh, in response to, to the COVID, uh, but late and on a very limited, uh, uh, limited way. Why it has been so? Why we have a procedure, we have an institutional mechanism that would have changed it completely because it would have basically one single coordination on, on the response and actually it has been a, a, such a fragmented uh, response. 
uh, basically because the member states didn't go through this, uh, this mechanism. Although we did use uh, elsewhere in the world, and sometimes we use also uh, for uh, limited uh, issues, uh, more limited issues in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And there is, was not even, and that was more worrying, uh, a, a demand by the public opinion, by the citizens to activate this process. Some was not aware, and some believe that, well, in this moment, we have to take care about ourselves. That was, for instance, the, the kind of Italian reactions. We believe that our very good, and actually it's much better for of whatever European civil protections can, can do. And that was, I mean, a pretty, pretty common approach in, in the rest uh, of, of the European Union. Then we had also uh, to try to coordinate the kind of health uh, decisions, public health decisions, uh, um, and all the business-related uh, decisions, so what to open, what to close, uh, uh, the rules of the game, uh, engagements, uh, of, um, uh, and, and, and so on. And here we do have very little legal basis, unfortunately, for having uh, uh, a real uh, political actions. Uh, and it is interesting to see that there are already a number of petitions signed by citizens uh, asking the European Union to take up this kind of competence for future cases. But we see the failure of uh, a system that is not really fit to try to uh, get a common, organically, structurally uh, joint approach on, on issues which are basically uh, common, uh, common challenges. Uh, third point, uh, we need to put in the economy and in the state budgets money, uh, financial resources, because uh, the cost of the crisis is, uh, is huge. And for some countries, uh, Italy is certainly one uh, um, very important example, your neighbor uh, Greece, another one, etc., is uh, <coughs> um, with very, uh, I would say, huge public debt, we need to find this money on the market. It's very difficult, so we need kind of European solidarity. I would say that when we talk about money, Europe is, is certainly is giving a, a much more interesting response. Because as a matter of fact, dogma such as the untouchability of the Stability Pact have been uh, challenged and it has been suspended, the Stability Pact. And we are talking about a package of different measures uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 billion euro that will be put in different European instruments in uh, disposals of uh, uh, European states in order to regenerate the, uh, 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 regenerate, uh, the, the economy. Uh, it is a very complicated negotiation. It's not a one-day decision. Uh, there will be certainly uh, room for disappointment, but and here again, we go back to what we can actually celebrate. Uh, the fact that we do have institutions, we have a budget, we have procedures, we have uh, uh, people that who have government regularly meet, not on a voluntary basis, but because we are part of a family. And uh, God knows if there are not a lot of disputes within the, the families. We are actually delivering, uh, we, I mean, the European Union is actually delivering a financial response that it is uh, with no comparison with whatever is happening uh, elsewhere. Who else could give money to Greece? Who else could give money to Italy? Uh, the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, huh? the FMI. <laughs> Uh, with all the contradictions and all the problems, it's basically Europe that is coming in, in the picture. And maybe with a lot of um, um, disappointment and happiness by the Dutch, of the Germans, of the Finnish, and here and there, but still, we are talking about a huge amount of money between 1,000 and 2,000 billions of euro in different uh, formats. Uh, and this brings to one issue that. I think it's, it's important to, to, to stress. Europe is not a place where anybody is making gift to the others. It's not um, a charity organization. And when we appeal for solidarity in generic terms, it's not an easy exercise. Uh, you have to conquer what you want. You have to be there with your credibility, presence, consistency, uh, etc. And this is not um, 
always an easy exercise to do for some member states. And even for some public opinion, we expect a lot, but uh, nobody's there to, to make any kind of easy generosity uh, to you. At the same time, it's not a wild world. It's not a place where everybody's giving hit of knife to, 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 to the partner, not at all. Uh, there are rules, you have to, to be consistent at the end, not easily, but at the end you can get something, but uh, it is certainly a step forward compared to the very anarchic and wild and just power game that we were used among, uh, among Europeans, and that is very true also in the terms of the relationship between Ottoman empires and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Christian countries on the other, on the other, on the other uh, side. So it's, it's certainly something which is uh, um, important to remind. I, uh, you mentioned I'm uh, the head of this uh, Asia department in European Parliament. Uh, I can see that my citizens uh, are not very happy generally with what Europe is doing. Uh, but when we ask, uh, would you like to be somewhere else today? Would you like to be in America with Trump? Would you like to be in China or in Japan? Would it be any better? Actually, nobody wants to go anywhere else. They still are very much disappointed with Europe, but they still believe that Europe is, after all, probably the best place to, to be, also in terms of solidarity. China, Japan, Korea, they have their own policy. There is no solidarity whatsoever. Nobody is helping China. Nobody is helping Korea. China is distrusting, um, uh, mistrusting uh, Japan. Japan is uh, is uh, is is not in any in, in, in very big friendly relationship with uh, with with Korea. Uh, China and India they have very odd relationship. India and Pakistan not at all. Pakistan and Bangladesh, etc. etc. So when we we compare the unsatisfactory degree of cooperation uh, in Europe with what is in the rest of the world, not to talk about the Arab world, the Arab countries that are fighting each other on all prices and very little, I mean, uh, uh, divisions between what is, uh, uh, and a huge division from Maghreb to the Gulf countries, etc. Uh, we, we, we see that with all the contradictions we have in Europe, actually uh, there is a, a degree of achievement, which is certainly uh, 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 remarkable, and that it's probably a matter of, of uh, um, uh, celebration. Final point, what we do now with uh, Turkey? Huh? How we can share this kind of um, um, moderate satisfactions on what is still there with, uh, with, with, uh, with Turkey, notably compared to the expectations that we did have in uh, early the, 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 the 90s. Uh, of course, uh, Turkey is not probably attracted anymore by the winning project, uh, the not winning project of the not sexy of the European Union. The European Union is very much focused on its internal problems and is not delivering answers to uh, any, any, anybody else, not just uh, on, on Turkey. So it is certainly a difficult issue. But uh, let me say that. Uh, and this is notably the message for, 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 for you students, for you guys, uh, new generation. Uh, we, we all know, um, this is not something that I have to tell you, you, you are students of the Bilkent University, that uh, there is no um, single global challenge that a, a single country can, can solve by itself. Whatever we talk about, uh, climate change, international crime, terrorism, immigration, uh, uh, financial crisis, etc. Uh, international cooperation is uh, is uh, absolutely crucial. And COVID, how to respond to COVID, how to share the medical data, how to recover from COVID, uh, etc. is simply another example. But the future will certainly offer many more cases where we understand that there are a lot of limits to nationalism and to uh, sovereignism, uh, which it cannot really do uh, that uh, that much. Um, Europe lost United Kingdom, um, but I don't think it's going to lose any other uh, member. Um, in the 90, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, where we are very much under stress with the financial crisis, there were a lot of talks how the euro is going to collapse. The euro area is, uh, is 
it's not going to and now we we, we listen a bit to some kind of music uh, started to play uh, to play uh, again actually it didn't materialize uh? euro is still there again under stress given the the, the euro area uh, uh, given the, the current circumstances but is 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 still there and there is when we look to uh, the comparison with the rest of the world, a clear perception, uh, I would say not yet a clear understanding, but it, the fact is there that Europe per se, it's very little. What is after all, uh, and this is exactly the same for Turkey, what is after all the, the, the advantage of, uh, um, of um, a country such as China? vis-a-vis -vis Europe. A lot of people say, well, they, they, they have dumping, social dumping, the very low salary, very low uh, cost of labor. Yes, that's by, by, by large extent, that's certainly true. But I, I think that the, the, the real advantage uh, of a country such as China is that we are talking about uh, 1 billion 400,000 people. And they do have one minister of foreign affairs, one minister of economy, one currency, one labor policy, et cetera, et cetera. We are in Europe with uh, uh, not anymore the UK, uh, 430 million, something like that. Um, Turkey is uh, what now, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80 million. Uh, well, we still go on with 27 Minister of Foreign Affairs, 27 Minister of Economy, 27 Labour Policy. Then there is the Turkish dimension, then there is the European Union dimension, so there is the European uh, Union diplomacy, the Euro Turkish diplomacy, etc. It's, it's a cacophonia that cannot really uh, um, work uh, with the competition of countries such as, uh, as, as, as China. One billion for hundred, one single entity. India is the same, Japan is the same, United States is the same, Indonesia, talking about 300 million people, it's one government, one structures, one kind of actions. And, and this is uh, more and more relevant to the case of Brazil, uh, etc. So in the future, the, this kind of issue, which is not a dream, it's a fact, will become more and more evident. Like it or dislike it for our uh, nationalist and sovereignist country. And this is, I think, very true also for Turkey. Turkey um, is a, a very uh, assertive country, and this is why I like it. Uh, there is a, a strong identity. Um, I think saying that, can, I see all the problems Turkey has with Syria, with Israel, with Armenia, with Greece, with the European Union somehow, with Iran, somehow with the Americans. So, it is, it is something that can go on for quite a while, but at a certain moment, as much as there is a strategic interest uh, in, uh, and there is a common geographical space, geography always matters, it's always important. Um, uh, it is not a very uh, um, sustainable situation uh, and role that Turkey is having, as much as the European Union is not a very sustainable uh, position on the on the long run, just to be uh, this bunch of countries uh, uh, by themselves uh, with basically half of the Mediterranean only and 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 things uh, and, uh, and 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 things like like that. Uh, in um, we all know the um, um, the the, the, the um, sorry yeah the um, 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 the novel by uh, George Orwell, 1984. Um, 1984, The Big Brother, no? it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a view in, in, in the future that Orwell had. But what is interesting also is that uh, Orwell uh, set the plot of 1984 in a world that was divided in three superpowers. Uh, Oceania, which was America, the, the two Americas, United Kingdom, Great Britain, that he, he did put already as part of uh, the American space, uh, South Africa and Australia. That was Oceania. Then there was East Asia, which is basically Japan, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and, uh, and, and China. And then there was Euro Asia altogether. Uh, that was Europe, Turkey, Russia, and uh, um, the Middle East as one single entity. 
Black Africa was the battlefield uh, of those three uh, powers. I don't know if Orwell, who was right in, uh, in, in imagining the Big Brother society very much, uh, is also right, was also right in figuring out uh, this kind of, uh, of the vision of, of the world. But certainly uh, uh, there is an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, suggestion in, uh, in, in that uh, uh, novel in terms of strategy. Well, um, um, I would make it, uh, I would stop here. Um, let, let's just, uh, uh, let's just me, uh, make me finish with a, with a quote by a, a British uh, poet um, that he said that a peer, because this is very, very, I think, pertinent for a Mediterranean country such as, uh, as, uh, as Turkey, a peer is a frustrated bridge. Uh, what beautiful expression, I would say. A peer is a frustrated bridge. We need actually to make our peers to become bridges, our ideas, our failed attempts, so far failed indeed, to become projects and, and facts. And this is probably the role of uh, uh, the new generation. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and inspiring presentation. And I think uh, raising the issue of young generation is crucially important because Turkey is a very young and dynamic country from that point of view. So in a sense, whenever people get pessimistic about the state of Turkish politics or Turkish society, there's always the silver lining that the country is young and young people can really make a change much faster than we may imagine. So thank you very much indeed. And now the floor goes to Milgün. Arisan Aral. So. Yeah, okay. Yes, now we can uh, Thank you, you Yanis. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this Zoom lecture. And thanks a lot, Mr. Rinaldi, for your extensive, uh, very enlightening uh, presentation or speech, whatever I call it. Uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't belong to this young generation in Turkey. Uh, like Mr. Rinaldi, I'm in my late 50s. I'm even one year older than him. Uh, <laughs> and my experience uh, with EU-Turkey EU relation uh, goes back for 33 years. Uh, EU Day, European Day has always been very important to me. Uh, First of all, I built all my career into Turkey-EU relations. I worked in different departments of government for almost 25 years, uh, dealing with Turkey-EU relations. My first position was with the Minister of uh, State in charge of EU uh, affairs when he applied for full membership. So my journey with EU-Turkey relations started in 1987. I was also involved in customs union negotiations. Uh, then uh, during the preparations for candidacy and after during the candidacy period, I was in the coordinating institution. Then it was called, as Yanis, you said, Secretariat General for EU Affairs. Then it had become uh, EU ministry. Uh, unfortunately, now, I think, given the state of Turkey-EU relations, it was uh, transformed to a directorate of uh, EU affairs under the, the, in the auspices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Well, why I said the European Day has always been important for me, because I thought uh, EU accession process, or whatever you call it, uh, would uh, uh, trigger a very important transformation process in Turkey, economically, politically, and socially, especially politically. As the internal dynamics in Turkey has never been too strong, or to be more honest, as the internal dynamics in Turkey has always been, to different extents, suppressed, I thought the process uh, of accession uh, would transform Turkey. That's why I always believed in this process. I never thought 
with the exception of a short while in early 2000s, I never thought Turkey would become a member, but I believed in the importance of this process. I will also uh, quote a poet, one of my uh, favorite poets, uh, a Greek poet, uh, Kavafis. Uh, I always refer to his most famous poem or one of his famous poems, Itaka. Uh, Itaka is the island and uh, Kavafis praised the journey to this island. Uh, he claims that this journey would enrich you, not reaching to the island itself. I usually uh, refer to this poem, but also I said, what we, would we do if the island disappears? Shall we be drowned? Uh, so apart, uh, now after, uh, after uh, giving this uh, short introduction, I will try to give a response to Mr. Rinaldi's presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to say ALDE for me has been one of the most important groups uh, in the European Parliament, together with the Social Democrats. Uh, I always share their values and I always praise their approach to Turkey because uh, Unlike the other groups, they always believed in the fact that Turkey has a right to become an EU member conditional upon fulfillment of EU's membership conditions. They've never excluded Turkey categorically on an identity basis. So as a citizen of Turkey, I would like to thank you for this approach. Uh, you said 19, you started uh, your a career as a Eurocrat in 1991. 1991 uh, is also very important for me because uh, that was the year after I had been working in the government for four years and that was the year I was studying for an MS degree in London School of Economics with an EU scholarship. I'm one of these uh, first scholars of Jean Manet uh, scholarship. So I also am grateful to EU for this opportunity as well. Uh, I was involved in, as I said, in the customs union uh, negotiations that were relatively much easier than the membership negotiations, of course. The reason, I mean, the customs union process had already started in early 1970s and in mid 90s we were trying to complete this process. Uh, Turkey needed this process, EU needed this process, they had to complete this customs union. So the negotiations uh, went fairly well and we managed to complete the customs union. I hope we can manage to revise it. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, say a few words at the end of my presentation uh, regarding the revision of the customs union. Uh, 90, early 90s uh, has always very has always been very important, as Mr. Rinaldi said, uh, because economic and monetary union was designed then. Uh, internal market was completed in early 90s. But now I also wanted to praise a very important leader in the EU, Jacques Delors. Uh, he was not a political leader, maybe. He was the uh, commission's president. I think the strongest commission president. And despite the resistance coming from some member states, he managed to put forward the plans for internal market and economic and monetary union. I hope the current commission would do the same uh, for, other, for other unions, for other policies, let me say. Let me uh, let me come to the uh, COVID nineteen and EU's response to that. Yanis knows that I recently wrote a piece because I was really I will use the word pissed off the criticisms of the EU, especially in Turkey, as a very important researcher in Center for European Reform. As Charles Grant wrote it, I also believe that coronavirus has given hope to those who wish to see the EU to stumble. And I wrote a piece, I like the title of the piece, so I want to say it. I, the title of my piece was The Unbearable Lightness of EU Bashing in the Time of Corona. Yes, uh, EU uh, reacted to Corona uh, COVID-19 very late. Uh, there was a moral hazard uh, in the inactivity of some member states like 
Germany and France to what was happening in Italy. But I mean, coronavirus was unexpected to the whole world. Uh, even some people refer to it as a temporary global power. All the countries were uh, unprepared to that. Uh, freedom of movement has been restricted everywhere. Uh, this put a sweet restraint on national health systems everywhere and damaged the economies everywhere. Uh, so it was, uh, I think it was unfair to single out European Union. One can uh, criticize the member states, but not the EU. Yes, member states were very late to react to first to Italy because it, Italy was the first and the most hardly hit because of coronavirus. But I mean, e EU institutions not. As Mr. Rinaldi also said, when Italy was first hit, uh, the Commission wanted to activate and actually activated the EU civil protection mechanism. But because of the inactivity of member states like Germany and uh, it, France, who, who restricted their exports of medical equipment and medicaments to Italy uh, and closed their borders, because of these uh, actions of the member states, the uh, EU send, uh, civil protection mechanism activated by the European Commission has become void. Uh, I always praise European Parliament's pressures to the member states to be active to help the other to strongly hit member states like Italy, Spain, and then France. Uh, so European Parliament was very active in inviting member states to react. And lastly, I would like to refer to the actions of the European Central Bank. European Central Bank uh, has prepared an enormous bond buying activity that would amount to, if I'm not wrong, 750 billion euros. That reminded me uh, the response of uh, European Central Bank under the presidency of Mario Draghi uh, in 2012, despite the resistance of some EU member states again, Mario Draghi said we would do our utmost to save Euro within the limits of our competence. Now European Central Bank under the presidency of Christine Lagarde is doing the same. She was questioned by the highest court of uh, Germany recently and she said uh, European Central Bank is undeterred by German court's challenge and they are quite answerable only to European Parliament driven by their own mandate. So what I'm trying to say, we have to differentiate between the response of the EU member states and the EU institutions to COVID-19 before starting the bash out, before starting EU bashing. And although EU was late to respond to that in general. Uh, there are significant improvements. Let me name a few. Ah, first of all, there, as Mr. Rinaldi said, uh, there are excuses of the EU. First of all, EU institutions, they don't have the competence in health uh, policies. Health policies are left to the competence of national states. EU didn't have the um, experience to deal with an a, a pandemic like uh, COVID-19. And lastly, although EU had mainly three mechanisms, I will name them uh, soon, uh, they were not very much used. These mechanisms that I refer to, first of all, is the EU's uh, pandemic early warning and response system. Second, this uh, mechanism that we both refer to, European Civil Protection Mechanism. And the third mechanism is European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And very surprisingly, positively, last week, uh, Britain, who uh, has already officially exited the uh, EU, secretly tried to be involved in the EU's pandemic early warning and response system. So EU is still there and EU is still attractive, I suppose. And also, uh, I think the action plan of the Eurogroup to uh, allocate 500 billion euros uh, for different pur purposes 
is significant. I already referred to European Central Bank's pandemic buying, pandemic bond buying. Uh, and uh, I think also it was important that at the end of April, if I'm not wrong, 23rd of April, the EU leaders in a video conference uh, agree, agreed to put together a recovery fund. All right, the amount is not certain yet, maybe 1 trillion euro, maybe 1.1 trillion euro. And the, uh, its division between its, uh, grants and uh, credits is not known. I think the Commission is working on that and soon they are going to submit their plan on it. But it is important uh, that uh, EU leaders uh, has agreed uh, on the importance of such a recovery fund. Uh, although they they made their negotiations through a video conference, I don't think uh, negotiating via video conference is as easier as a face-to-face -face conference. But I think this is important. Yes, they couldn't uh, agree on corona bonds. They couldn't agree on mutualization of debt because they think that without mutualization of responses, mutualization of bonds will too much will put too much strain strain, I'm sorry, for relatively uh, well-to-do countries. Uh, also, yes, uh, this one, this makes one question, the solidarity principle, the Europe, the also question the European identity, but it is difficult, I think, everywhere. Uh, like even in a federal like a federal state like United States, it is it is difficult. Also, I think for uh, Corona bonds for mutualization of debt, uh, EU needs a financial union as and as financial union is associated with political union. That's very difficult to achieve nowadays, as Mr. Rinaldi pointed out. Political union, unfortunately, nowadays has become a dream. We don't know what will happen in medium term or long term, but for the moment, it is uh, it is like that. E, what I'm afraid of uh, about EU nowadays, uh, there is. We all know that Commission has given back uh, the competence in state aids uh, to member states. Also, the stability uh, make stability pact's financial rules were relaxed. And uh, Schengen is not there anymore. Countries, I mean, EU member states are controlling their own borders. Uh, what I wonder whether this com these competences will be easily given back to Commission. This might cause a problem. Uh, and also I, I question what is important in the EU's agenda nowadays? I mean, if COVID-19 wouldn't be there, is the digital and ecological transformation. Uh, I wonder whether ecological transformation would be easy after COVID-19, as COVID-19 increased the uh, employment problems in many member countries. So uh, in like industries like cement, plastic and automotive industries will not be able to manage ecological transformation as easy uh, as possible because of the employment problems. Uh, now I will come back, uh, we are running out of time, so I, will, uh, I would like to end up with uh, Turkey-EU relations. I'm a bit pessimist in that sense. I don't think a real improvement in Turkey-EU relations can be realized uh, if Turkey still refrains from going back to the reform process it once uh, managed to accomplish, I'm referring to the times in early 2000s. EU has uh, made mistakes in this process, Mr. Rinaldi uh, made it clear. The EU accepted uh, Cyprus without a settlement, so removed all the motivation from Greek Cypriots for a settlement in the island. Some powerful European politicians excluded Turkey on an uh, identity basis. Hence, uh, they told the uh, citizens of Turkey that we are others. We recently conducted an opinion poll in Turkey. There is still 60% support for EU membership, for EU accession, but only 23% of the population think that we can one day become a member, no matter what we do. 
And third uh, mistake of EU uh, was uh, permitting the unilateral blockage of some negotiation chapters without being based on any EU decision, even if they contradict with EU decision. Uh, finally, the final mistake of the EU was turning a blind eye to what was going in Turkey. Uh, I'm talking about democratic backsliding, backsliding because of real political issues like refugee deals. So EU has made many mistakes, but of course the main mistake lies in Turkey uh, because of because of uh, democratic backsliding. So I don't envisage a real improvement in uh, Turkey-EU relations. Uh, I, unfortunately, EU leaders, EU council and some powerful member states don't want to revise, don't, don't want to initiate customs union modernization negotiations unless there is rule of law in Turkey, uh, it, unless it is reinstated in Turkey. Although maybe pathetically, uh, we uh, expect that if negotiations for modernization of customs union can start, they, it, they can reinstate rule of law, at least in the economic sphere. Fear. Now the talk of the uh, talk of the town is that uh, as there is a problem in supply chain, as there is the talk of relocation of supply chain, uh, some of these supply chains can be relocated in Turkey. So this can re, uh, reinstate a new relationship, a transactional relationship between EU and Turkey. I doubt it as well, unless there is rule of law in Turkey, because. Uh, uh, unless uh, uh, there is mutual trust between the parties, even supply chains cannot be relocated in Turkey. Uh, at least in the economic sphere, EU would like to see rule of law, uh, because I remember when we were going around Europe uh, defending that EU mod uh, in negotiations for modernization of customs union should start. We were told by our counterparts that Turkey is not even fulfilling some of its commitments regarding customs union and applying non-tariff barriers. But uh, there is always hope, uh, uh, even between the EU's and Turkey's official institutions, cooperation can be lacking nowadays, but uh, civil societies, local authorities, are and they can still improve their relations and we shouldn't have a static viewpoint to Turkey relations. I mean, I remember there were times I completely lost my hope about uh, reinitiating the relations like the 1997 Luxembourg uh, summit. They can always, there's always light of hope. I would like to end here and try to answer the questions or hear the comments of the students. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you very much for a very enlightening presentation. And as you said, although the situation is not very optimistic on the sort of government to EU level, I think the uh, figures you, you shared with us about the strong public support for Turkey's EU membership is something very important. And uh, civil society cooperation and interaction uh, through different channels uh, supported by the EU and beyond them is a very important way to keep the story going until political conditions are more suitable for yeah. to return to the sort of the state of uh, political and economic reforms that Turkey was uh, like 15 years ago. Ago, you are right. So uh, I will uh, let the floor now to you students. Like I will keep my questions for later first. Uh, I can read the question from Murat Jan. Uh, in terms of economic resources and me medical support, how do you evaluate EU member states' actions, particularly towards Spain and Italy? I suspect that that's a question mainly for uh, Mr. Rinaldi. Do you have any other questions that are relevant so we can bundle them? Anybody else wants to ask a question? Um. I have a question, should I write? Yes, it? John, yes, you, 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 you can take the floor, please. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentations. My question is about, um, while Mr. Rinaldi was talking, it came to my mind, um, after, the war, uh, after the war, there was this from destruction to reconstruction period, and it was um, somehow revolutionary because it was um, right after the war, so things were changing um, fast. Um, like right now we are having this crisis and things are 
again changing or ex at least expected to change um what do they think about these processes does it is it going to start something again somehow revolutionary between these actors the eu and turkey or the eu and western balkans and all these actors or it's not really going to change because there is this uh, reluctance of already existing uh, institutions or because yeah at that time there was no institutions for cooperation so it was from zero it was easier somehow what do they think about how the covid will affect the um the the, the state of affairs in terms of cooperation and in terms of um continuation yeah thank you john and punar has I also, a, mm -hmm. yes i also want to uh, yes want to uh, so yes please um from mr rinaldi actually mm -hmm. he said that in his presentation europe european union lost united kingdom but will not lose any other country regarding this statement and thinking about the hungary the hungary case uh mm -hmm. which had announced that they accepted an emergency law and which which is a bit criticized by european union because of the yeah and effect so how would you think about this so will european union will not lose hungary in all of these situations and what would you think about hungary thank you very much and uh salman mm, hello john i think my question is about is related to Brexit in a way because we have talked about Turkey's integration process, Turkey still trying to join the EU. Uh, at the opposite side, we see that <clears throat> uh, one of the biggest countries, UK, leaving European Union. And there's speculation that uh, both in UK and in other European Union, European member state countries, that this might uh, ignite the fuse of a of a new trend that European Union, leaving European Union is actually beneficial to any country, might be beneficial to any country who are actually member states now. What do you think that uh, it? What do you think this the effect of Brexit might have on Turkey and other countries that still try to join the EU? Do you think that it would be like it? It would. Um, damage their enthusiasm in a way or it maybe it might affect eu in a in a sense that they might try to ease this um european th their acceptance policies thank you very much mm -hmm. thank you salman let me read two questions that i received at an, on the chat box so Punar is asking, how do you evaluate the solidarity among the member states during COVID-19? And Neve is asking, do you expect a surge of left-wing movements across the EU to the potential economic consequences of the COVID-19 crisis? So I suggest that, let me add two questions of myself too, and then I will give you the time to answer sort of all the questions that belong to each of you in a sort of coordinated way and then we can conclude the event so i have a question for uh, mr rinaldi first uh, there has been a decision of the U german constitutional court that has attracted a lot of attention uh, and that has raised a lot of concerns about your skepticism not in the countries we normally expect it from coming sort of like southern european countries crisis-ridden countries. Many people were concerned about, for example, the effect of uh, the COVID crisis on Italian Euroscepticism. And because Italy already had some sort of strong populist uh, and anti-European movements, and there were many concerns about them taking even a stronger boost out of this. But now we have the German Constitutional Court adopting views that are barely pro-Europe, like this quite anti, very, very Euroskeptic. So how can the EU manage this sort of different sort of versions of uh, creeping Euroskepticism? And the question for uh, uh, Ms. Arisan Eralp, you talked about how the EU-Turkey relations should be value and norm-based and not transaction-based. 
and you pointed at towards the Turkey-EU migration deal as sort of an example of how things should not be going on, as if I understand well. Uh, nevertheless, the issue is very much on the agenda, uh, and it is one of the issues that are sort of going to be burning because uh, Euroscepticism in many countries is linked to migration. So the two issues are sort of interconnected. So what do you think a proper EU, EU response should be in, on this issue? So what you, would you advise? How can the European uh, authorities try to let's square the circle sort of, of keeping their values and sort of like maintaining their loyalty to European founding principles while also making sure that immigration is controlled? So, uh, you want to go first, Nibun? Okay, let yes. me let me start uh, to. The uh, answer uh, with Pınar Akdeniz's uh, mm -hmm. question, because that was uh, directed to everyone, then I'll answer your question. How do you evaluate the solidarity among the member states during COVID-19? Uh, the solidarity is there. It, yes, uh, at the beginning, the solidarity was not there, especially towards Italy, uh, but uh, the, it was Late, late coming, but it was there. Why I'm uh, saying this, as uh, I refer to, there's financial uh, assistance to these countries that is coming, and also France and Germany fortunately turned back from their mistakes uh, through the rescue program initiated by the Commission. Medical equipment and medicaments are being provided to Italy uh, and Spain, hardly hit countries, and also the uh, seriously uh, serious patients, Italian and uh, Spanish patients, are being taken to the uh, hospitals of Germany and France when there is capacity to do that. So I think the solidarity uh, has become rather late, but now it is there. Uh, I question that from here, I will jump to the question of Yannis. Uh, I think the crisis where we observe a serious dent in solidarity was the refugee crisis. Uh, as EU couldn't uh, settle the uh, refugees among themselves, uh, as most of the burden were put on Germany and then Italy and Greece, uh, as they are the Greece and uh, Italy was first member states where refugees arrived to. Uh, the other countries, especially Central and Eastern countries, uh, didn't want to take refugees. Although as a solidarity, as a matter of solidarity, they should have taken, uh, they should have agreed on a quota system to take the refugees. They refused to do so. Uh, and that's why uh, they've become dependent on countries like Turkey. Some even refer to this refugee deal between Turkey and the EU as the dirty deal. Because of, uh, uh, because of this deal, as I mentioned, EU has to a certain extent turned a blind eye on what was going on in Turkey. Uh, and I think as long as EU uh, cannot put together a sensible migration policy, an important uh, burden sharing part of it among uh, the member states, taking all the burden from Italy and Greece and, and Germany, uh, they will be dependent uh, on countries like Turkey, and I'm sorry to say that, but they will be dependent on the kind of blackmailing tactics on third countries. What EU has to do, in addition to put together a sensible migration policy, they have to invest in the source countries. That was the impression I get from Team Europe's 20 billion euros to be uh, to be transferred to uh, countries source countries like in Africa and Middle East and I think EU should be more active in preventing the instability uh, in the source countries like EU hasn't done anything in Syria unfortunately this was an answer to your question Yanis. thank you thank you very much and Mr Rinaldi the last word to you Yeah, thank you. I, I, I'll first start with uh, uh, some questions uh, which have been made by uh, the, the students. Uh, uh, Hungary, for instance. Uh, Hungary mm -hmm. could be another 
could we have a, a anger exit or something like that i don't think so frankly um hungary is a completely different country than the united kingdom the united kingdom made its choice uh, also based on the very strong partnership with the united states of america of the existence of the commonwealth of a kind of a mentality uh, which is a sort of post-imperial mentality that is a self-sustainable country uh, as such, which probably is a very wrong approach. Uh, we will see how the United Kingdom will, uh, will do uh, outside the European Union. Already now it, has in a very, it is in a very difficult uh, position between interest with China and has to follow uh, Trump's uh, approach on China uh, and, and, and so on. Hungary is a small country in the middle of Europe, I mean, what, what, what can, and it's not Switzerland. Uh, so what, what Hungary can really do uh, by itself, I think very, very, very little uh, after all. Uh, moreover, I would say that the situation in Hungary is uh, very special because it's very much determined by uh, one person who is extremely popular in the country, has a lot of consensus, has some kind of charisma, but it is not really something which is structural in the in the in the society and even less uh, in in the history or the tradition of a very middle european uh, um, uh, country so I, I i don't think so frankly uh, how brexit could uh, could uh, influence uh, uh, future membership certainly the european union um, um, has a damage in terms of enthusiasm as has been said and in the pr terms it's a, it's an awful situation we have a prominent member who decided well it's not convenient and uh, it is not just the government it was really the citizens uh, that basically twice uh, even after three years of debates and some kind of threats if you don't uh, stay in the european union there will be economic collapse of your country will confirm the decision and decide to, to leave very bad for the european union uh, indeed okay. Again, uh, peculiar debate uh, within the, the British society in this time and, and, and so on. Uh, but um, um, in a way, the countries who wish to enter the European Union, which basically now are Ukraine and the Western Balkans, uh, are even more committed. And um, um, for the European Union, there is also the interest to show that the process of, uh, of the EU is attractive for, for others. So in a way, it is easier now for, for some countries because, uh, uh, the, the, well, Albania is not United Kingdom, uh, but, but, but the trend that there is still a, a capacity of attraction uh, by the European Union is, uh, is certainly something that Brussels at a certain moment wants to, to, to show. So in a way, it can be even easier now than, uh, than before the, the Brexit for countries wishing to to enter the EU, and again, the countries who are interested, their, their willingness is still is still is still there. Uh, another question was about um, um, economic resources and medical support. Um, well, uh, that has been somehow also already answered. Basically, I would say that the the, the medical response has been limited. Uh, somehow, it is there, notably in uh, coordination, which is there. Uh, for uh, research, uh, for trying to find vaccines and uh, um, advanced uh, um, medical equipment and so on. And this is easier for the European Union as such because there is a very strong legal basis for research uh, uh, and, and joint program and a lot of money. Uh, but in terms of actual daily delivering for masks or other things, uh, smaller things, uh, uh, the perception of the citizens was that the European Union was not really providing uh, any support. And that's certainly bad. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, financial uh, resources, uh, as I said before, the, the kind of response that is, uh, is, is, is being cooking now, uh, it, it's, it's actually unprecedented and it is without comparison with whatever uh, else that may happen in the rest of, of the planet. So money is, is there. That brings me to the, to the question which has been raised by Yanis, the German Constitutional Court. Uh, in Brussels, reactions are um, um, a bit mixed, but generally not that worried. We are talking about huge amount of money. This is not an easy process. Uh, it is, uh, by definition, there will be controversy. 
and uh, in some countries there can be inflammatory speech of nationalists. In other countries, such as Germany, can be a sort of scrutiny by the legal system. And the, the scrutiny actually is, is not groundless because the German court is actually pointing out uh, to uh, a sort of disproportional use by the uh, European Central Bank of its powers. And, um, and this is a, a, an issue for the politicians. Draghi uh, exploited all the space he had for its own mandate of what is probably the only proto-federal institutions in the exactly. EU uh, mechanism. But exactly. it, I, I could agree, and I'm very much supporter, being a federalist myself of Mario Draghi, but it, it probably went a bit farther of what was allowed by its mandate. And there was political consensus there. But the Germans, they, they can be very, very touchy on that and be extremely exigent and, and severe and say, well, listen, either you change the rules of the engagement of the ECB, or otherwise you, you, you have to play in a more moderate uh, way. It is uh, um, the whole issue, the different instruments the different instruments that are going to be used, how much money, uh, or the delivering system, etc., uh, the legal basis, and the Constitutional Court of Germany is actually questioning the, the, the legal basis, it's part of a complicated process. And again, this is normal when we are talking about figures such as the one we had before with the quantity easing, and now even more with the, with the with overall uh, financial uh, package. So it's a part of a struggle. and. I wouldn't be scared about, about that. It's a fact of life. It's a fact of political process of the institutional life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, Europe is, uh, is, uh, is complicated. And the, the German constitutional court is an additional factor of, of, of complication. But it's not out of the, of, of the blue, out of, of the context. Um, I might say something about uh, also um, um, what... Uh, what uh, has been uh, said by uh, Mrs. Uh, Erald, um, and also by a student, actually, yeah, on uh, when he was mentioning, well, the revolutionary time of the 90s and in the 50s before, and then the 90s, where we are now, I mean, it's much, much less uh, inspiring, uh, uh, etc. Well, uh, <laughs> as much as I, 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 I fully appreciate, of course, uh, what, whatever has uh, been said by Mr. Erop, there is a statement I fundamentally disagree with, 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 with you, with her, with you. Uh, and uh, and that's, that, that's a problem, I think. When you said that the negotiation process uh, was there and for you, uh, the negotiation process uh, meant a lot because it was a way to change the country and to apply a number of reform. But somehow you didn't believe that membership could be uh, at reach, eh? could be uh, a, a uh -huh. real goal. Um, well, um, I think that, that has been the problem those years. Uh, the, there were too many people engaged in, uh, in, in the negotiations and too few people really believing that the goal was to achieve membership. Any process is always a killing process. Uh, we, we see uh, in uh, Israel, Palestine is a classical example of a process that is, was, as long as it is, I mean, the, the longer it is and, 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 and it is, is killing all kind of expectations, is exhausting, uh, etc. And that's, of course, also what's happening. What happened and what's happening uh, between uh, the EU and, uh, and Antarctic. There is indeed a very long list of mistakes that can be drawn. European Union mistakes, okay. Turkey mistakes. Okay. I have no idea who is more mistaken than, than, than the others. Uh, again, it's a matter of, of perception. Uh, but, uh, I believe that, um, that the dreamers are not the ones who still believe in a very residual position, I, I admit that, that, well, uh, um, EU and Turkey will be together one day. Uh, I think the dreamers are the ones who believe the country. Because uh, on the long run, uh, I insist on that, and I work on a daily basis with Asia, 
the European position as such is unsustainable and Europe will need Turkey, which is there, located where it is and with a huge economic economy, economy and potential, etc. And the same way the other side, Turkey by itself, uh, I don't think can, it's, it's just a matter of having a different leadership and things may change uh, rightly uh, quickly. There is uh, an objective uh, convergence of strategic uh, interest. It will take decades. It's not for tomorrow. But that doesn't yeah. mean that the process is over. Those things may take a long time. Maybe in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 20 years, there will be much less demographic pressure from Turkey, which is an issue for some, uh, for, for, for some Europeans, and this problem will be solved. Maybe already in 10 years, we will have a number of Turkish origin politicians in the European Union, we are already having some of them, who can become also a bulk of uh, good lobbyists for uh, membership of, mm -hmm. of, of Turkey. Uh, so the, 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 there is, uh, uh, as much as things have been changing since, uh, since the 50s and then since the 90s, they might change later on. That's again, is not an issue for, uh, for most likely for, 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 for ourselves. Uh, but it will be for, um, for the students, uh, for the generation. It's a beautiful goal. It has to be embraced, not with resignation, but with joy. There is something still to be achieved uh, that we didn't achieve, but is, 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 still, uh, is still available as, uh, as, as a target. Of course, leaders uh, matters. Uh, Yanis, uh, uh, or oh, actually you, Mrs. Serov, you, you mentioned uh, Jacques Delors, uh, certainly uh, a, great, uh, a, a great man. We have a very, um, I'm speaking here as a, as a, as a politician, not as a EU official, but I'm, I'm, in a way I'm less uh, um, optimistic than you on the current uh, status of, of the EU. We have a, a very poor leadership. And the response yeah, of the COVID has been very poor in, in these terms. Nobody really said very strong words. Nobody took the plane and, uh, and went to Madrid when it was still possible, maybe for half an hour, a couple of pictures, the EU is here with the citizens, or in Milan when it was at the beginning of the crisis. In terms of communication, there has been a disaster. We, there is this, uh, this, the, those two different roles, the member states and the EU institutions. But as a matter of fact, the society, the business people, the students, the citizens, uh, they don't make the difference. We are all uh, in a way, in, 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 the same, in the same basket. And somehow, the EU institutions have to be more assertive vis-a-vis -vis the member states, more uh, declaration, more, uh, as Draghi did with, uh, with the European Central Bank, and as nobody think. else has done in the Commission, in the External Action Services, and, and, and so on. So there is a struggle to, to, to play there. Uh, uh, by the European institution internally with the, with, the, with the member states because, like it or not, we have very much the very objective excuse, we do not have competence, we do not have the, the legal basis, but again, for the citizens, uh, EU member states and EU, uh, to, to, to some extent, comes to the same. Well, thank you very, very much to both of you for your very interesting uh, presentations and uh, thank you very much to students for being uh, with us today. I think uh, we kind of celebrated Europe Day in a very <laughs> a meaningful way because we raised some of the very important issues that the European Union and Turkey are facing, but we also shed some light into the future and I think that's the most important uh, thing to keep in mind from our discussion today that uh, with all the problems, the European Union is likely to be a very sound response for a number of global questions that are with us no matter whether the EU would have existed or not. So being together makes everybody stronger and Turkish membership will make the EU and Turkey stronger on, on very, very important uh, ways. So institutional, political, economic, so no matter whether the short-term vision, the short-term picture is not very optimistic, we still have to keep on working because the project makes sense in the real sense. So yeah, exactly. thank you very much, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Ms. Alessandra, for uh, your uh, presence today. Yes, you want to say something? Mr. Rinaldi, oh, thank you. So yes, so, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch 
And uh, I will share with you the link of this uh, presentation and this discussion. So uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, well, I just you. thank you. And uh, whoever you, that's also addressed to the students, uh, uh, by chance comes to Brussels, uh, get in touch with me. I will be very happy to, to, to meet you in, uh, in the European Parliament. This is wonderful. Thank Hi, you very much. Thank you, Yanis, for this very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for accepting thank the invitation. You. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Rinaldi. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you very much. Bye bye.